Hello everyone, Christopher Beast from VSL here, and in today's video, we will be explaining what led to the nuclear war that eventually caused the events we see in Vigor. Before I provide um, the, the theory and the idea that I want to propose here, I do want to show a uh, ton of evidence that led to this theory. So if you haven't watched the Red Norway video, I do highly suggest you watch it, as a large part of this theory revolves around the ideas already set up by that theory, um, and it also proposes a ton of evidence that strengthens this theory, um, helping it make it less of just abstract thought and more solid potential truth. So, there is the first point of evidence uh, that has come up since then is that the game does play, take place in 1991. This year will cause some interesting things if we look at it historically, as this is the year that the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, I personally do not believe that the immediate collapse of the Soviet Union directly caused the nuclear war, um, but we'll get onto that in a, in a bit. Next piece of evidence has to go with the fact that pretty much every single map that we go to has some sh shape or form of military presence. I say almost because Falkenda does break that trend, but this does show that Norway in particular was heavily militarized pre-war. Next thing to note is that the year that P90, or, or the ADR in the game, began production was in 1990. Based off this, we can assume that the nuclear war occurred in late 1990 or early 1991, because there would have to be time for the gun to get out to people to be appearing in uh, supply drops. So with all of this basic ideas on the table, I now want to suggest the theory that will try to explain why the nuclear war occurred. So, this time when all starts in 1985. 1985 is a very interesting year in uh, Soviet politics. This is the year that Gorbachev, the last leader of the Soviet Union, will rise to power. Soviet Union collapse is directly related to Gorbachev. Gorbachev believed that ideas such as Glasnov and Pestrosha would help repair the Soviet Union and rally them to a unifying cause of uh, communism or the Soviets' uh, nationality. This didn't really happen, and his ideals for better of the world and the, all of society would cause a lot of pro-democracy and a drastic leap to the um, to more liberal ideas within the Soviet Union. And all of this combined would eventually completely collapse the Soviet Union and cause all of the Warsaw Pact and the ex-Soviet republics to become independent countries. So, what if Gorbachev never came to power? Gorbachev doesn't come to power, Glasnov and Petrosia would never happen. Now, just assuming that, okay, Gorbachev is gone, instantly the Soviet Union would never collapse. That's just false. The Soviet Union would still collapse, but I'll get on to that in a second. If Gorbachev never rises to power, um, and never gets, uh, like, he never stays in power, he never does his ideas, the question is who would replace him. For this, I suggest Gennady Yaniev. During our timeline, he acts as the vice president of the Soviet Union. He was a very weak man, as described during the 1991 coup, as being someone who did not have resu uh, resolute cause behind his actions. Someone who was very weak in, in uh, ideology, and honestly couldn't understand whose side he was fighting for. He was also heavily influenced by Vladimir Khrushchev. Vladimir Khrushchev is the leader of the KGB, and the evidence to show that he was being orchestrated again goes down to the 1991 coup. We have a lot of sources in the description where you can find a lot of evidence proving that Khrushchev did influence Yaniev, um, causing a lot of the events in 1991 uh, coup, the artist coup, that is. The, Khrushchev is a very interesting figure if you look back in history. He is a as the leader of the KGB, he would help orchestrate a ton of pro-Soviet revolts. And he was a very 
he was very good at spreading the idea of communism to other countries and help at spending the war against capitalism. So, if we actually look at the timeline that I'm proposing, it would, as I said before, start in 1985. Gorbachev either gains power and dies immediately, or is quickly killed, or never gains power. Yaniyev, or maybe even directly Khrushchev, come to power. These people would be the heads of the much more conservative, more militaristic side of the Communist Party. These would be the people that, in our timeline, would revolt in the 1991 coup. So, with Yaniyev or Khrushchev in power, we would begin to see a very different Soviet Union than what happened in our timeline. 1986 would most likely still see the Chernobyl reaction meltdown, and that wouldn't really change. However, where things start to change would be the 1989 revolutions. The 1989 revolutions most likely happened as early as they did and as quickly as they did due to the multi-party system established by Gorbachev. This would eventually lead to the collapse of the Eastern Bloc Communist parties, and this entire cascade of slowly the Eastern Bloc completely collapsing due to the multi-party system established by Gorbachev wouldn't happen. Yaniyev and Khrushchev would never allow that to ha- the parties to gain power, and they most likely would have been doing what they were doing for most of history at this point, completely violently crushing rebellions. Now, this is not me saying that the entire reason why East Europe was able to break free was because of Gorbachev. More or less that it happened as early as it did because of Gorbachev. It's inevitable that the Eastern Bloc, which was very much trying to leave communism, if you look at things such as uh, solarity in Poland, very much trying to gain back their independence, gain back their liberties. They just wouldn't be able to do it as fast. It would not happen by 1989. It, it really realistically couldn't happen by 1989. But it would definitely still be something looming over the um, Communist Party. The Communist Party, once again, we look at the people in the 1991 coup, they understood that they were trying to unite a people that didn't understand uh, communist centrality anymore. The Soviet idea of a Soviet Union was collapsing by 1991. But if Yaniyev and, uh, and Khrushchev are still in power, what they're going to want to do in order to make sure they don't lose the Eastern Bloc, which is losing morale and and very rapidly spurring out of control, what they're going to want to do is unite them against a common enemy. And this common enemy would have to be a member of NATO. It would have to be someone they can fight in a war, win, and prove that communism is the highlight, the pinnacle of humanity. What many uh, Eastern Europeans were taught in, in believed at this time. So, if we look at a map of the Cold War, well, all of this, there's a lot of countries that border the USSR in Europe. They also, there's also countries over in Asia, but if we really look at Europe, you have to, there, there is the realization that if the Soviet Union wanted to attack NATO, one of the easiest places they could attack would be Norway. Now, the, Norway was defended. That is a fact. Norway is very well defended. But you also have to consider the fact that West Germany at this time had Reaganist policies and was, like, unimpenetrable. And if you take into the fact that if a war in West Germany erupts between West and East Germany, the East Germans are going to be fighting West Germans, which would be something that the Communist Party would never want. This is a chance for the East Germans to reunite with the West Germans, and they they realize that the East Germans are not loyal, more loyal to them than the West Germans. They would much rather unite with their comrades across the wall. So, out of all the countries in, in Central uh, Europe, they, they have to attack Norway. But again, thinking about it logically, an invasion of Norway, while yes, Norway was weaker and didn't have the issues of morale, wouldn't really be strategically possible by the Russians. And it didn't happen in our timeline because it, the fear of long supply lines and not being able to send enough troops. So, what we suggest, expanding on Red Norway's theory, is that 
The Russians realized they couldn't fight a direct war, so they did what they did in much of the Middle East. They started a war within the people. They started a communist uprising. This communist uprising would lead to civil war and see many of the messages we see from Red Norway pop up where people would revolt in the streets, most likely from both sides. Capitalists worried about the increase of communism and communists wanting to overthrow the Norwegian government. And I would say that, well, yes, the U.S., CIA, and the Norwegian government, as well as even the British governments on the side of NATO, would suppress communism. If the Communist Party put enough backing into their communists there, it wouldn't be too hard to imagine a pro-communist revolt. So when the Civil War eventually would be, it's, it's inevitable that if one, both sides are backing aside, we'd begin to eventually see what we see in much of the Middle East in our timeline, a proxy war between NATO and the USSR. However, I don't know exactly how far this war would go, because it is a direct member of NATO. But that honestly doesn't matter. What inevitably ends up happening is this communist army backed by the Soviets would begin to see victory, as we can see with messages such as military failure from Drog. This is a sign that the the Soviets have captured a fort. They won a battle. And while we don't know how important Drog is, it is a sign that the Soviets were pushing in and they were winning. We see Soviet tanks on every map. We don't see American tanks. We don't see NATO tanks. We don't see NATO trucks. We see the Soviet army, which can make the belief that maybe the Soviets won. Maybe the Soviets outright won the war. The only issue is we can't say that. And I'm not going to say that yet, because I don't have enough evidence. But we do know that the Soviets were doing well, too well for NATO. And eventually, whether it be the Soviets realizing that eventually, maybe the East Europeans started uprising, seeing them comrades in Norway getting under the communist foot, they, they had enough, and they started uprising. Maybe that's what caused the USSR to hit the nuclear button. Or maybe it was NATO realizing the loss of Norway with the sheer amount of potential land that the Soviets would gain, the loss of many protection systems that helped defend NATO countries. Also, the large amount of um, the materials in Norway helped make nuclear weapons. This would be a massive issue for pro-NATO forces, and maybe they did say, let's hit the nuclear bomb. But, now it's drawn to what happens after the nuclear war. Norway was most likely not actually hit by any nukes. I say this because if we look at our theory, we look at, like, everything in the game, you, there's even a message in the tutorial saying that Norway was, wasn't hit. Norway was the safe haven. And even with this theory, it doesn't make sense. Why would the USSR nuke their own troops? Why would the Americans nuke their own troops? It wouldn't happen. So NATO remains a safe place. I mean, Norway, not NATO. But after some time, the radiation storms we see in the game are going to start wiping out the native population of Norway. I think the greatest example is Fist. We have a direct dev tweet that says, and just like that, Fist Factory went quiet. As the fast breaths became silent, it was obvious, man simply isn't stronger than the radiation wave. But regardless if it was Fist being hit, her, hit first, it has to be noted that these red storms are most likely what wiped out the native inhabitants of each map. Uh, another thing I do want to mention here is that Grondheim was most likely the last map to be hit, as we see many newspapers written by Grondheim that uh, are about post-nuclear situations, such as hazmats, the nuclear bombs, and enemy armies. Following all the defeat of the nuclear wars happened, every single map is, is dead, we enter the game bigger. This is when Outlanders from all across the world are trying to retreat to the last safe place. Um, the capitalist world, or whatever remains of it, is the person behind these airdrops. As the airdrops are dropped by C-130 Hercules planes. And the clip you're most likely watching now is from someone uh, on our Discord called JCP Shadow. I'll have a link to him in the, uh, in the description. But um, here's a video of the plane and then an image of the plane. So, 
This shows that either the Norwegians, the UK, or the US are dropping these airdrops. Like, as I said before, the capitalist world. Which means that most likely the, uh, the capitalist powers of the world are still doing reasonably well. But regardless if they are or not, it's important to note that the entire Outlander uh, situation of gathering these airdrops is being propelled by someone with access to these planes and expensive resources. And whether it's the capitalists as a union or just one of the three countries, that is something that might be investigated on a future date. Now, there are some alternate <laughs> timelines that were suggested. I personally don't really like these alternate ideas, but they are possible, so I will propose them. The first one suggests that maybe in the 1991 coup, which saw the Soviet radicals take control of Russia, actually worked. This would mean that the radicals that I'm suggesting take control in 85 actually take control in 91. They would have to immediately attack Norway and immediately escalate to war within the rest of 91. Meaning August 91 to December 91, because the game still takes place in 91, you'd have to have invasion of Norway, nuclear war, and then the game takes place. Which to me just doesn't, it's too fast. It, there needs to be more time. The last theory is a divergence, big divergence from our timeline. It happened even earlier, uh, during World War II. World War II, Norway was occupied by the German army. And this theory suggests the Soviets won the white win winter pretty fast. And they quickly liberated Norway. This would mean that the Soviets would take over Norway. And in our timeline, what actually happened was the Soviets were approaching Norway. They just got stopped in a stalemate pretty early into their invasion and weren't really able to liberate it from the Germans. Um, this idea would suggest that in 1990, when the Soviet Union eventually collapsed, the rebels in Norway do a civil war, just like we suggested in earlier theories, and that eventually the Soviet leadership in the West, due to collapsing, would destroy the rest of humanity. Uh, humanity. My issue with this theory is it's just pretty far-fetched, in my opinion, but it is a theory. I mean, maybe maybe the USSR didn't get in a stalemate. They own Norway. Norway has nothing to do with this grand scheme. And the nuclear war just happened because the Soviet Union collapsed. All right, so that's a couple of back, uh, a couple of decent timelines to suppose to propose here. Uh, I do want to note an update to the list of Soviet guns. I made one during Red Norway. I want to make one now. First thing to note is we have the IZH, SKS, PM, PM63 Rack, Scorpion, A74K, RPK, and VSS. And if we include guns from the previous update, A74KSU, RPK74, AKM, and SVU, SVU, and PPSH. This gets us 13 Russian guns. This large number of guns could be because of design, ease, and the fact that a lot of Russian guns are pretty much the same model. But we could also take it to show a large Soviet influence. So with all of this down on the line, honestly, I believe the next theory that we need to look into is who actually fired first. Well, it does seem right now that the evidence mounts up that the West fired first. There is a slight inconsistency with that. And for me, that inconsistency is the Soviet Union collapsing. It, it would inevitably collapse in the 90s. If, if so, it's quite strange to me that the West would fire. Knowing that, most likely. But, as always, if there's anything you want to add to this theory, please do comment below. Um, if you enjoy my content, be sure to hit that like button. And if you want to see more, I like to, I like to see subscribers. I mean, I feel, I feel great when you guys subscribe. Uh, this theory took a lot of investigating. Huge shout out to Robert E. House over on the VSL Discord. He helped really solidify this theory. And if you want to help with this theory writing, or just want to chill, go over to the VSL Discord. Both of the guys I mentioned in this video were from there. If you see them, give them some love. They deserve it. Um, we also have a Twitter. We've had a Twitter. If you want to go see our Twitter, the link is in the description. Um, I really hope you enjoyed this video. This has been Christopher Beast, and I hope to see you all next time.